You aspire to be an audiophile, but you don't have the megabucks to be a proper audiophile. So how can you be an audiophile on a budget? And how will people know you're an audiophile? Now, that's important. I'm looking for the one thing that will distinguish a genuine audiophile from a mere hi-fi enthusiast. OK, it has to be the megabuck budget. But other than that, what is it? Any guesses? <laughs> Monoblocks. Monoblocks. I said it twice because you'll need two of them. But you knew that. If you're not up to speed with this concept, monoblocks are twin, separate power amplifiers. So you don't just have one stereo power amplifier, or heaven forbid, an integrated amplifier. You have a preamp and your two mono blocks. And this is what I have for you today in this video. Let's unblocks. <laughs> OK, the packaging is a bit odd, but I'm guessing that these are pre-production samples and what you will receive will be much tidier. It's what's inside that's important, and what's inside are two fuzzy V3 mono monoblock power amps and a power supply. And a power supply splitter cable, so one PSU powers both amps. If you're seeing a similarity between the fuzzy V3 mono and the fuzzy V3, well yes, they are similar. I suspect the naming has something to do with the popularity of the regular V3. Popularity? Well, it has certainly attracted a lot of attention on the internet. And it's popular with me because I use one to help me create all my irritating unboxing music. The album's coming out later this year. The reason I use the V3 is because Fozzy sent it to me for review. And I was setting up a new studio setup. Setting up a setup, that's what you do. So I needed an amp. The Fozzy V3 was there, it does the job, and it does it just fine. I don't need a bigger amp or a better amp, and if I had one, it wouldn't improve my music. Not, of course, that my music needs any improvement, but I'm sure my commenters will weigh in on that. <laughs> so what's the deal with monoblocks? Really, I have to say that only audiophiles with the very sharpest ears will hear any difference. But I don't have a problem with getting as close to perfection as technology will allow. It's an honourable end in itself. But suppose that you could hear the difference. What would you hear? Well, the key has got to be reduced crosstalk. Crosstalk is where one channel leaks into the other. I said the other, but it would be an other in a mixing console or any professional studio. Broadcasters in particular hate crosstalk. Because you could have someone chatting to a co-worker about the weather, bleeding through into the news. And the topic of the unwanted conversation might be something much more undesirable than weather. I say this to make the point that crosstalk is a real thing. I could rant on about crosstalk in multi-track analogue tape recorders. But I should probably leave that for another video. A long video. <laughs> But now that we have digital audio, crosstalk doesn't exist. Crosstalk is a purely analogue phenomenon. If you know of a problem caused by digital crosstalk, other than in the case of operator error, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. But once music leaves your streamer, DAC or whatever your digital source, 
it's in the analog domain and subject to crosstalk. The thing is, unless equipment has been really poorly designed, it's going to be at such a low level that you can't hear it. And even if you could hear it, because you're listening to stereo and the two channels are related, you're not going to notice it. This is my view and I'll be happy for commenters with different opinions to make good use of the comments section below. Anyway, it stands to reason that if you have two separate power amplifiers, one for each channel, crosstalk will not be a problem. Either audible or something that you can't hear but you might worry about. OK, that's reason number one to use monoblocks. But hang on, some people will be saying that monoblocks improve stereo separation. It's the same thing. If there is audible crosstalk, then stereo separation is degraded. If stereo separation is degraded, then it's probably due to crosstalk. There's more to this separation thing that I might talk about in a future video, but it's enough just to mention it for now. So, reason number two to use monoblocks. Let's suppose that your speakers are three metres apart. This will, of course, depend on the size of your listening room, but three metres will do for now. If you have a stereo power amplifier, your speaker cables will be at least one and a half metres long. That's if your amp is in the centre. You might want to have it off to the side someplace so your cables might be three metres long. I'll just throw in that it's my belief that both cables should be the same length, even if the amp, stereo amp, is right next to one of the speakers. To make them different lengths is just plain wrong. Now, with your monoblocks, you can have each amp very close to each speaker. Your speaker cables can be as short and fat as speaker cables should be. I said that you probably won't be able to hear the difference between a stereo power amp and monoblocks, but if your speaker cables are skinny and puny, you just might. Of course, now we have the issue that your interconnects between your preamp and your monoblocks have to be longer. That shouldn't be a problem in terms of audio quality, but if you're paying a thousand pounds a metre, as audiophiles do, and more, then suddenly you have an expense that maybe you didn't expect. All part of the fun. Now, reason number three. In a stereo power amplifier, it's likely that both amps will share the same power supply. This, one would think, might be a pathway for crosstalk. Then, suppose one channel demands a lot of current at a certain moment. Might this starve the other channel of its needs? And voltage. Voltage sag is certainly a potential issue. There are a lot of things here that are saying, to be honest, truthful and morally righteous, each amp needs its own power supply. And with monoblocks, that's what you have. Well, <laughs> let's get into the V3 monos. The first thing you'll notice or not notice is the volume control. There isn't one. <laughs> this is a good thing. If you had volume controls on both the amps, you'd have to match them, which is definitely a fiddly thing to do. And there's always the doubt that you haven't got it quite right. If there were volume controls, then you'd probably bang them up to max and control volume from your preamp. But without volume controls, the amps are maxed anyway. This is good. Actually, I'm telling a porky pie. <laughs> there is a bit of a volume control. On the back, there's a gain switch, 25 dB or 31 dB. Nice. An issue I found with the original V3 was that the gain was only just enough to drive my home cinema speakers. There were plenty of amps and watts available from the V3, but if the gain isn't there to get the voltage, you can't make use of all of them. Audio Science Review, which is a fun website to go to if you have an eye for charts, they measure the V3 at 26 dB. So that extra 5 dB available in the V3 mono might come in handy for some users. I'll add that having a lower gain setting allows the volume control on the preamp to be higher, so less likelihood of tracking problems. Also around the back we see the inputs, unbalanced RCA with the switchable gain I mentioned earlier, and balanced XLR. The XLR is a type that has a quarter inch jack socket in the center, so I'll presume we can use that too. I didn't get a manual with these samples, so I'm having to guess some of the details. The gain switch I mentioned earlier is for the RCA connector. So, it's time to give the V3 monos a listen, see what they can do. This is my Alcove studio setup where I make my irritating unboxing music. Album coming out later this year. <laughs> As you can see, my fuzzy V3 takes centre stage and I have the optional orange knob that makes the sound quality more highly resolving.
It's easy therefore for me to unplug the V3 and plug in the V3 monos. The power cable could do with a bit of tidying and I'll do that if I decide to keep this setup. What I'll say about the V3 monoblock setup is that it drives my BMW DM100 monitors perfectly and it will go way, way louder than I'll ever need. The 25 dB gain setting is best for me because I can have the output control on my audio interface in a more convenient position. I have no quibbles. Quibbles, I have none. Now, another setting. On the front, as well as the RCA XLR switch, there's the power switch. It has three positions, off, on, and auto. What I gather from Fozzie's marketing is that with auto engaged, the amps will switch off after 10 minutes of no signal. No, <laughs> I didn't time it, but yes, they do switch off. And they switch back on again instantly when signal is restored. I find it pleasurable that I can switch the auto option off and be in control myself. Maybe I'm just a control freak. <laughs> Did I say I have no quibbles? I don't, but maybe you might. Remember when I said earlier that one of the advantages of monoblocks was that each amp has its own power supply? <laughs> well, you might have noticed my hints so far that I received the V3 monos with one power supply and a splitter cable. <laughs> so this is one of the purported advantages of monoblocks straight out the window. <laughs> Well, to me, I don't think I'm going to hear any difference. To you, well, if you think you might, then there's a handy comment section for you to share your opinions. And your opinions are welcome. And, of course, it's so obvious, because the power supply is external, you can use a separate supply for each amp. Spoilt for choice. But I might talk about the power supply that I was sent. It's a slab of Chinese beef steak at 48 volts and 10 amps. That, with the wonder of arithmetic, calculates to a potential power output of 480 watts. <laughs> As we know, many, most, or possibly all budget amps from the land of the giant panda quote their headline power output using the biggest possible power supply. Well, I seem to have the biggest power supply that this amp will accommodate. So if Fuzzy claims that the rated power output of the V3 Mono is 240 watts into 4 ohms with the 5 amp power supply, then I'd guess two V3 Monos with the 10 amp supply will get somewhere reasonably close to 240 watts each. These are the figures anyway. For me, it's loud enough. PFFB. <laughs> this is what you've been waiting for in a Class D amp, yes? Yes. Really, it's what we've all been waiting for. There are those, and they are flexing their comment fingers right now, who say that Class AB is the only way to go, or even Class A. But they're eccentrics with electricity to burn. Yes, Class D has its issues. As we know, Class D works by switching the signal on and off at a very fast rate. It's clever, it's efficient, amps can be small, amps can be cheap. But the switching frequency component can leak through into the output. And it does. I've seen it for myself on my oscilloscope. Of course, you can't hear it, and probably your speakers can't even get close to resolving it. But it's there, and it can cause problems. To get the switching frequency component down to as low a level as it is in commercially marketed amps, which it legally has to be, then the output has to be filtered. This can be using an inductor in series and a capacitor in parallel. Or the costs can be brought down using a ferrite bead as the inductor. I have this, by the way, from Texas Instruments Information. A low-cost ferrite bead can degrade the THD performance of the audio after the filter, affecting the audio performance of the end system. So that's bad, and that's just the summary. So how can we, or how can Fozzy, fix that? PFFB. Post, filter, feed, back. Feedback. Feedback is a wonderful process where a sample of the output of an amp is fed back and subtracted from the input. Briefly, it stabilises the gain, lowers distortion, and improves flatness of the frequency response. There are, of course, feedback naysayers, and doubtless they'll be commenting below. However, for me, and most reasonable human beings, feedback is nothing but a good thing. PFFB, then, post-filter feedback, includes the filter in the feedback loop, thus reducing any artefacts that are due to the filter. There's a lot to this, and I'll include a link to Texas Instruments documentation 
in the description. Now, of course, according to the book of Proverbs, there's no such thing as a free lunch, which is probably why we're seeing PFFB as a new thing. But if it can be made to work with no ill effects, what's not to like? Maybe I'll cover this topic as a standalone in a future video. OK, I'm going to leave it there. I suppose I might have mentioned the opportunity for op-amp rolling, but I'm saving that for a future video. Really, and no one's paying me to say this, other than being sent the V3 monos and maybe there's an affiliate link. As far as I can see from a short period of testing, this is an excellent product at a very attractive price. So I'm going to rip the V3 out of my alcove studio and become a mono-blocked audio file with the V3 monos for a while. We'll see how it goes. The big question is, will it improve the quality of my irritating unboxing music? Album coming out later this year. <laughs> see you soon.